Um, welcome uh, back, everybody. Um, now we will have a talk about uh, uh, by Van Dahl. He is uh, a lawyer, if I choose the right word in this case, uh, at uh, Digital Defense. Uh, he has uh, lots of experience with uh, uh, civil di digital rights, if I say it right. Uh, so um, um, he will tell us about uh, how to deal with your user data if you're a startup. So please, a big applause for Ot van Dalen. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, first a bit about my background and, and uh, uh, why, why I uh, do uh, speak here. So um, before, uh, before becoming a lawyer or starting my, my own law firm uh, in the field of privacy and security, I was the uh, director of Bits of Freedom, the uh, Dutch digital rights organization. I uh, restarted in 2009. Uh, because I, <laughs> thank you, uh, because I was very uh, concerned about um, uh, the infringement on our uh, civil rights, our fundamental rights, the right to private communications freedom. And um, I always felt that it was a big luxury to be able to do what you believe in. So uh, when I uh, did a bit of freedom, I uh, started my own law firm, which is also focused on privacy and uh, sort of has a political agenda, not only a commercial agenda, but also a political agenda, namely the defense of fundamental rights. And that's also why I'm um, happy to speak here, because um, I think that uh, one of the issues we never focused on with, at Bits of Freedom, but which is even more fundamental than communications freedom, is economic freedom or uh, uh, economic rights. Um, you can easily see that if you don't have the resources to express yourself, then being able, then having the right to express yourself doesn't mean anything. So um, when WikiLeaks uh, got kicked out of Amazon, um, it's to uh, servers in France, uh, but um, the US government immediately uh, took measures to shut down the financial income of WikiLeaks through donations uh, with their uh, credit card services. And this was an, maybe an even more fundamental attack on their uh, freedom to operate. So um, one of the things I'm very much concerned about in the last eight or so, or especially in the last five years, is the loss of autonomy in financial services and the loss of autonomy in, in financial services. Um, and, and, and that's why and I hope that cryptocurrencies will be implemented, are able to um, uh, re replace this, uh, replace the role and the anonymity which, which uh, analog cash provided. Um, meanwhile, we have to make do, uh, and we live in a world where providers uh, exchange uh, euros to cryptocurrencies and the and law and in the course of a criminal investigation uh, comes to these companies and asks them to provide user data or provide other uh, transactional data. And I thought it would be interesting to give you sort of an overview of how you should deal if you are a startup or a provider of financial services and you get a request from law enforcement, how you should deal with this. Um, so I uh, uh, answer two questions. Um, first of all, when the police calls you and asks you for user data, what do you do? And when the police sends you an email and wants, for example, to have information on all transactions or on initial transactions, what do you do? Now, um, let me first, this focuses on Dutch law, uh, a bit on European law, uh, but I don't focus on US law. And, um, uh, it'll probably give you an idea on how to approach this, but uh, it, it's wise to, uh, to check with your local lawyer how you, how you deal with this uh, uh, in your country. <laughs> so, um, in order to uh, discuss this uh, idea of how to deal with data requests, uh, a 
first a lesson, a basic lesson in data protection law is in order. So, um, data protection law stems from Europe rules, which um, all revolve around the idea of identifiability or personal data. If something is personal data, then you as a company process this personal data, then you are bound by certain laws, certain rules we will get to later. And the question is, what is personal data? Uh, personal data is data which can directly or indirectly identify a person. Now, in the context of financial services, uh, account numbers are, of course, personal data. Transactional data, like who uh, uh, or IP addresses, are also personal data. Um, just a detour, but um, people sometimes try, try to anonymize data sets. Uh, in order to make them not personal data anymore. Uh, but this usually fails because it's very uh, really anonymized data sets. So when Netflix published uh, anonymized data sets of their users on the internet, the mother was outed uh, when, when the researchers to analyze the data set and through a combination of which videos she watched, she actually, they were actually able to pinpoint at her. AOL, which anonymized uh, search results, uh, search, and, uh, and the New York Times uh, actually uh, went through the search results, uh, search queries, and and contacted uh, a 59-year-old woman in the in the vicinity of New York uh, and confronted her with her search query, search query. So um, to anonymize data, but for the purposes of this talk, all of the data. Uh, that the law enforcement that police requests from uh, is personal data, no doubt about it. If you process personal data, then you are bound by certain rules. What is processing? Processing is a very broad uh, range of activities, which include the, the, uh, well, the collection, the storage, the analysis, and forwarding of data to others. So if you actually give data to law enforcement, you are bound by certain rules. Now, one of these is that you need to have a certain basis for the transfer of data to enforcement. You cannot just give data to uh, uh, someone else. You need to have a certain basis. And there are several bases which are added for in personal uh, data law, data protection law. Uh, one, for example, is if you have explicit consent from um, your user, then you are able to, of course, provide this data to someone else. So if the user consented to this, then it's okay. Another one is if there's a legitimate interest in doing so, and legitimate interest can be some commercial interest, but that's a very thin line and, and, and uh, usually requires some legal analysis when there is a legitimate interest and what the regulatory authorities consider legitimate interest. Now for our main basis on which uh, you uh, justify transfer of personal data to authorities is um, because the law obliges you to do so. This is also a legitimate basis for providing uh, information. And the next is, when does the law oblige you to do so? And uh, this is where uh, uh, the Dutch uh, uh, procedural codes come in. Uh, at tough wording, uh, as it is called in Dutch, which states the powers which the uh, Dutch police has uh, under which circumstances they can ask which data from who. And I will go through this uh, in the rest of my talk. So criminal law basics, other side of the coin, this is which powers has the government to request data. There are specific powers for specific kind of data, specific circumstances. So it's not like there's one ranging provision in the Dutch criminal procedural code which says, um, if necessary, you can request data from everyone. It, it depends on the gravity of the case and, and uh, the person who is asking. Um, now there are three uh, main provisions in the Dutch criminal procedural code which are uh, relevant for uh, you mostly if you are a provider. 
namely uh, Article 126 NC, Article 126 ND, and Ar Article 126A. And I will go through them. And these are uh, all specific examples of how the police can invoke to request personal data from you. Now, Article 126 NC is the least least evasive of the provisions. Um, it allows the police to request identifying data, which is name and address behind, for example, or behind a, a Bitcoin address. Um, it allows the police to request this from all, uh, uh, basically all processors of data, all, all companies which might have this data. And it allows the police to request this in case there is a suspicion, suspicion of a misdrive, of a crime, which is less grave than, uh, uh, sorry, which is graver than if you have a, an offense uh, of a trading. Um, and it allows us to do, uh, to request this by an uh, ambtenaar, just an investigating officer, which is sort of every police person, right? So it's, it's the least invasive in terms of what you can ask, but it also has a lower bar for who, who can ask it. Now, Article 126 ND is next in line and is broader in terms of what you can ask. So it allows the police to request all other data. Um, and it allows the, uh, the police to request it from everyone, but you need to have a suspicion of a serious crime with, uh, with a penitentiary um, uh, 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 with four years maximum. Uh, and um, uh, only the officer from justitie, the public prosecutor, higher in the hierarchy, uh, can, uh, can, uh, can request uh, the data. And then Article 126A, the specific provision for financial investigations, which will probably also be used in most um, uh, cases if, uh, if you come across uh, a Bitcoin company or other cryptocurrency company. Uh, it regards the requesting of data, all data from everyone. And uh, the only requirement is that it needs to be in the course of a criminal investigation, which is ordered by a court and the responsigating officer uh, requests this data. So it's, you have to actually show sort of a, a warrant, which is the um, uh, actual order to request this data but it's a very broad provision. Um, so let's say you have one of requests. How do you deal with them? So here's a checklist. It's not science. Uh, first of all, if it's voluntary, you don't have to cooperate. In fact, there are risks in doing so, and these risks stem from you violating data protection law, because data protection law requires you on the basis of on, on a legal basis. Now, if there isn't, is, if, if there's just a voluntary request, you're not obliged to provide this data. And the question then is, why are, on the, are you actually providing this data? So that's an easy one. If it's voluntary, you can just say to the police, I will not go. Um, it uh, usually writing, this is stated in, in uh, the provisions I uh, just discussed. Only if there is only if it, only if it's urgent, it can be verbally uh, 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 can be asked verbally. But then you have to get the request in writing. So um, uh, if it's on the telephone, not urgent, then you can also send them away. And then you can ask whether the competent person is asking. Uh, so uh, if you see that the request is on the basis of Article 126 ND, the, the, the middle one I just discussed, but it's requested by an investigating officer and not by the public, pro public prosecutor. And it's clear that you uh, can send them away because that's not the right authority to request this, right? And then the legal ground for the request is clear. They have to mention on the basis of which provision they are actually asking this. And uh, you have to check whether the data is covered by the legal authority. So if um, um, other data, then, then, then identification data is asked on the basis of Article 100 and C, so the first one I discussed just now, then uh, you can send it away because it's too broad. It, 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 Article 126 and C only relates to 
uh, identification data. And the last one, which is the most difficult, whether the request is not overbroad. So are there, there are uh, uh, instances where the um, uh, police asks for all records of everyone. For example, uh, uh, there's one court decision where the police asked for um, the travel records uh, of, uh, of an airline company on one day of all passengers. And the court then decided this is too broad. You have to actually pinpoint uh, uh, who, you want to, uh, who you want to focus on. Otherwise, it's a fishing expedition. There are also examples of the um, uh, police asking um, all visitors to a website, the IP addresses of all visitors to a website on a certain day. This is also overbroad. The government has, to, has confirmed this also. So that's how you uh, deal with this. Um, now, um, the question then is, uh, what defense may you have to protect the privacy of your uh, customers? Now, the first defense measure is uh, warrant cannery. Uh, uh, may have read about um, uh, already. Um, this was developed in response to uh, gag orders in the US not only requested user data, but also prohibited the company from speaking about that they got this request. Yeah? Is that possible in the Netherlands? Um, um, uh, yeah, well, no, it cannot be there is a blanket obligation um, to not um, uh, disclose information about secret services uh, requests and also uh, uh, police requests, but I'll get to it later. Um, so the response they developed is they put on this word on their website which, which says we haven't received a re request like this yet and they remove it the moment they get this request which sort of uh, is a way around this idea that you can now that you got this request. Now it's obvious that you need very careful with this idea and have to do it well. So uh, um, uh, recent um, organization, recently uh, uh, started organization, um, actually removed the Warren Cannery from their website and then put it back on and they said that it was an administrative error on their side. But you know, who are they to try? Um, anyway, uh, so, so Warren Cannery is one, one, one defense measure. The other one is transparency report. You've read about this obviously. Um, uh, Google, um, uh, Dropbox, but also uh, Dutch companies are, uh, uh, are, are, are doing this. They, they <coughs> annual or quarterly reports in which they in, give information on how often they uh, receive requests um, from law enforcement. And this obviously needs to be aggregated because, and that's the uh, 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 um, caution I'd like to give, um, under Dutch law, you have a confidentiality obligations with this, these requests. So, obviously, you cannot inform the person about which the data has been requested uh, uh, directly when, when, you, when you got this request. Um, but the question then becomes, if five requests um, are uh, the persons involved uh, able to derive from that actually have been the uh, subject of an investigation. So um, if you are publishing ag uh, sufficiently aggregated requests, then the question is, can these be sort of de-anonymized de by the, uh, uh, by the uh, 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 persons under su suspicion? Um, and another uh, problem is you cannot talk about the secret service uh, context. Uh, you have an obligation there too. So um, be very careful with this, investigate this uh, before, before um, for, your, for your own uh, company or your own startup. And the last one, and this is probably the, the easiest one, is data minimization. The less you store, the less uh, can be released uh, uh, by, by law enforcement. So you, uh, eventually, when you become a more mature company, you will start thinking about policies for storing data. How long are you going to store data? Uh, when are you going to do delete it? What do you actually need in the longer term, also from an administrative point of view or, or a tax purposes point of view? Um, 
uh, but but uh, but th this is a viable and sustainable t strategy to at least give some privacy for users. So that's, um, that's my story. I, uh, I'm now for questions if you have any, and uh, otherwise feel free to uh, contact me later on. These are my um, uh, 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 contact data. Thank you. Maybe if you ask a question, I repeat it. Yeah. Um, do you consider the blockchain to be uh, data? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, so the question here is, um, is it, it indirectly identifiable data. Obviously, it's directly identifiable data because it's just addresses and transactions between these addresses. Um, um, there, are, there are instances of, uh, for example, FBI chasing uh, uh, people, basically back to, the, to, their, to their initial uh, owner, like the SoCode, I believe, uh, SoCode um, uh, founder. Um, Yeah. He was traced because it's the same username everywhere, and he was the first. The one username names on some forum. Yeah. Uh, was the first to announce that there was something like Silk Road. Yeah. So their reasoning is that if he is the first one who announced it to the public, yeah. it should be quite. Uh, Probably that he is the guy. Yeah. As far as I know, that is the but not from the blockchain. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay. So so anyway, I think it's a, it's an interesting question. It's also a complicated question. I know about de -anon de anonymization in Bitcoin networks, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it has a lot to do with that question: whether you are mm -hmm. able to, on the basis of transactions, mm -hmm. uh, derive who is actually doing the transaction. Yeah. For example, if you have. Uh, you know, if you have a shop uh, and they have a, a, a Bitcoin address, so you can buy yeah. coffee with Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, you know the physical location of the shop if they have the same address. Yeah. I know the who, who were there that day with Bitcoin. So in yeah. that sense, you could somehow reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't know who they are, but it, the, I yeah. personally think that in a few years, the anonymity will be obsolete within the blockchain because I, I don't believe in anonymity. Mm -hmm. and, and you, you know, yeah, you can, you, 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 the people, it's the same problem with uh, you know nerds sitting in the zolder, uh, and, 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 and yeah, and they think that they're anonymous. Nobody sees them sitting there. Well, they can like the microphone <laughs> has stopped. I think. Yeah. Oh, oh, Maybe. Oh. But, I mean, it, it feels anonymous, but it isn't anonymous. It, yeah. It really, it, 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 it's called a dictionary. It's, it's uh, because well, people, uh, So, so uh, I, 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 A, N, A, E, I'm not an engineer, but I know that, um, uh, but I understand that if properly implemented, uh, cryptocurrencies can, ex can actually be. Uh, they are working on it. But yeah. It isn't, I mean, it isn't proven. No, no, I understand that. Yeah. Okay. So. This is a side. Though. Yeah, it doesn't work, so I have to. Uh, let, let me repeat uh, your question then, yeah? Oh, it's not that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, just as a side note, um, one of the coins I've been working on recently, the developers come out with a new concept called off the chain sending. So, uh, yeah, off the chain sending. So, you give you the optional. We give you the option as you're about to send your transaction through whether you want it to, this, uh, to be recorded on the blockchain. Um, this is a pretty good anonymous feature because if you choose no, only you and only, um, I mean, only you can know where it went, there will be no data held on the blockchain of where it came from. It gets distributed to about 20 nodes or more, depending on where it's broken up and then sent to the user at the end. So there's no actual data recorded. So it's, you know, data minimization. We're referring to 
So I think that would be pretty good if you comment it later on. Okay. 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 Other questions? Yeah. Do you have any opinion on what Bitcoin is or how it should be priced, like as money or an asset right. or right. information, pretty much anything like that? Right. So the question is, let me repeat it also for the camera. Do I have any opinion on what Bitcoin is and how it should be categorized? Money, freedom of speech, an asset, etc. Um, I believe that currently it should probably be categorized as an, as an asset as, and not as money. Uh, I believe that the reasoning uh, uh, by the regulatory authorities is correct as money is considered to create a sort of contractual bond be uh, between the receiver and the, uh, the uh, sorry, the, the one giving away the money and the uh, one receiving it. Um, uh, but um, I can also see um, that sustainability or the viability of the whole uh, Bitcoin system, it would be wise to have a certain regulatory uh, um, supervision over it because it has very much a functionality currently. Um, and uh, where there's money, uh, I would say that uh, a certain regulation is, uh, is in this, but uh, the libertarians in the room will probably disagree with me on that. Are there any more questions? Please, re yeah, please yeah. just repeat yeah. these questions. So where, where's the website? Where's the form I can fill in the police just called me? What's it <laughs> Right. Um, so th the website is digitaldefense.net and, uh, and, uh, and, and this is my email address. I also have some cards if you... So it's all solved. Yeah. Email your lawyer. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. <coughs> Sorry. Um, th there are these, um, uh, what's called, mechanisms on the yeah. in Bitcoin, like uh, CoinJoin and uh, various listing services. If a user uh, sends Bitcoins to such services, um, is but, but he or she, by the very fact of using that service, opening himself to liability of any mm -hmm. price? I mean, you, no committing of any crime, are you right? Using them for because you want anonymity for no, say, no. It's very, very comparable to the use of cryptography and and you know. Uh, uh, and repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. The, so the, the 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 question is: Is someone who's using uh, uh, um, a mixing mechanisms or sort of laundry of your bitcoins uh, 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 by by this very act uh, opening up to uh, criminal or civil liability? Um, uh, not that it is a crime, but you know it may be sort of facilitating, or or uh, and uh, and I don't agree. It's very much uh, com comparable to the use of encryption technology. If you're encrypting uh, communications, uh, you can use it for various purposes, and it's no uh, crime to uh, encrypt your uh, communications. It's a crime to anonymize your uh, assets. No. No. Yeah. Uh, we know in the U.S. that there's the Silk Road guys on local bit people. Um, there have been legal steps taken against them. Have there been legal steps taken against anybody in the Bitcoin community here in the Netherlands today? So the question is, we know that in the US there have legal steps taken against Silk Road founders. Uh, have there been uh, legal steps taken against uh, a Dutch uh, um, uh, people in the Bitcoin community? Um, not for the sole uh, uh, reason that you were using bitcoins. Uh, I know that um, uh, I think the replacement or, or maybe even Sil uh, Silk Road founder. Well, any, anyway, it was a website where you could buy drugs via via Tor. Uh, was actually a Dutch person, <coughs> and uh, he was uh, um, uh, investigation was started against him, but not for using bitcoin. I right. think that's the most important. And it was in America. He was. Uh, he went to America. He w he was but caught was in America. Done, yeah, it, it wasn't done by the Dutch police, but by the American police. Yeah. So so there's no there's been no cases. There was one not, not uh, no. incident with Coinbase coin yeah. where uh, uh, another ah, yeah. uh, whole <laughs> development team of the we have to like keep on this. What is that down to? Was one of the guys got arrested? Oh, not arrested. He got a civil uh, uh, civil complaint. Yeah, it's, it's a get by Americans, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, yeah so that so, so yeah. He, he mentioned that that the, the Kanye coin was a uh, was a substitute and, and also one of the developers or one of the spokespersons of the Kanye coin. Um, uh, but this was a trademark issue. It was basically he was using the name Kanye for the coin, uh, and, uh, and 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 Kanye wasn't too happy about this. Uh, it, the coin itself. Yeah. Other question? All right. Well, uh, very happy to uh, give you some information, and feel free to call me if you have questions. small break, get some drinks, get some tea, and be back for the next presentation.